Okay, so welcome back. We've been talking about what are some of the, the human dynamics of park ranger, basically. So our assignment for class this particular session was to crack open the NPS National Park Service website for your specific national park or park bike unit and try and just get an initial sense of any kind of these sort of human descriptors of who are the people generally visiting your park at kind of a broad brush, sort of very broad label level because every visitor is profoundly unique. We're all special snowflakes. But when you're dealing with two, four, six million visitors a year, we have to kind of organize folks into not just convenient, but highly effective bins uh, or categories or typologies so that we can kind of not spend all of our effort on like the first 10 folks that we know down to every atom and so forth. Okay, so how did that go? Just open-ended feedback. Were you guys able to find any demographic information on your visitors? Sometimes this is pretty easy, sometimes it's kind of a big goose egg. How'd it go? Pretty good? So-so, yeah. anybody else? Thumbs up, okay, good deal. So, we wanna get a sense of trip and user characteristics, right? So trip characteristics are gonna be on-site things expressed like activity. Group size, group composition, so is it a family group, is it a couple, is it a solo traveler, and so on and so forth, so that we know accurately what folks are actually doing and sort of being on site. Um, as far as user characteristics, that takes a little bit more digging at times and is critically important for reasons we'll talk about today. If we can get that far, we want to keep uh, grinding through chip characteristics and so forth, but we've got uh, plenty of ground to cover real fast. Okay, so at this point for your national park, start kind of keeping notes on what you do find. There's not a quiz on the age structure of your national park uh, visitation per se, but kind of throughout the semester as we start filling in these blanks, um, pretty soon now we'll get to the file and throughout the semester just kind of plug stuff into that and by the end of the semester you can have a really detailed picture and management plan and it's not like a horrible do it all on the last week of class kind of a thing. Okay so when I'm talking about age structure, age structure is typically expressed as a graph and maybe you've seen something like this. Now social science recognizes more than the course binary but this is how the data are typically collected historically. So it tends to look kind of like a tree with age zero people at the bottom and then sort of a sideways bar graph for the count of how many people uh, are in that age bin. So like zero to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30 and so on and so forth, all the way up to 100 plus. And do that for each kind of sub-segment of your population, and then see what general shape this bar graph takes. Typically, it's mostly symmetric-ish, left to right, if it's done on gender, but there are some meaningful differences in terms of how long people tend to survive based on sex and gender, based on race and ethnicity, based on socioeconomic status, right? So down here, we could have other things or we could just call it humans. And then it's you know, just a one-sided tree, and we can imagine it reflected to the other side for symmetry if that helps your brain. So if this is people, centenarians, 100 plus, this is people 0 to 10, right? How would this look for your part? It's not going to look exactly like it reflects the broader American populace because not everybody is equally and proportionally 
the state parks for the reasons we talked about at the end of Monday's class session, right? So some folks are underrepresented, other folks are kind of oversampled, so to speak, right? So typically we have a lot of little kids showing up. That's exciting, that's good, right? Introducing the next generation to parks and so forth. So 11 to 20 tends to be a little bit less. Now speaking in generalities, if we like average together everybody's age structure graph in terms of their visitor demographics, we'd see something like this, right? So 11 to 20 tends to be a little bit lower because at that critical 18 years old in the United States cutoff, some folks are not going on family vacation. They are independent adults or emancipated minors on their own, okay? And then, for a lot of reasons, there can be a lot or very few, depending on the specific park, folks 21 to 30, and then we start seeing Another sort of sideways bulge out, and then an exponential fall off that there are very few people, 100 plus, visiting national parks. Okay? And so forth, all the way up. So, if you see any reference to demographics, it's probably not in what's called a frequency stack chart like this. It might just be in paragraph form. So, uh, 47% of all of our visitors are in the 18 to 35 demographic. Sometimes the bars are divided up a little bit differently, but same idea. Okay. A lot of national parks, though, have a very different age structure. It might be something like this. So, same scale, almost nobody and then 60 to 70, if that's the right number again, below that. 70 to 80, maybe. And then almost nothing above that, right? So just let's speculate for a second. Let's interpret, let's connect meaning and understanding and reality to abstract concepts like frequency counts by age. So what kind of a national park would have so-called inverted age structure, where it's kind of a fat chart down at the bottom here for the standard, basic, average out one. This one is extremely top heavy. What kind of a park would have a whole bunch of folks retirement age and older, and almost nobody below that? John? Florida. Florida well, National Florida, Parks. Arizona, because, like, Florida and Arizona? Retirement places. Okay, so collectively we could call those Sunbelt Parks in the Sunbelt states, right? Uh, one with good accessibility. One with good accessibility, nice and flat, right? Not a whole lot of steps to climb up and down, okay? Potentially to fall on. Falls for folks at highly advanced age based on losses, natural losses and bone density can be life-threatening. Okay, cool. All right, let's run around the other way. What would be a park that is middle heavy? This is called a bimodal distribution. There are two peaks in it. Where we have older folks, 50s and 60s, 60s and 70s, and a whole bunch of young adults, 20 to 40. But a knockout of a trough in the middle. What kind of a park might that be? The Great Smoky Mountains. Okay. Why? The why I say Great Smoky is because you've got a lot of younger people bringing in their kids or grand the grandparents bringing in their kids for the trip or whatever for the summertime or crap like that. I mean, I'm just thinking like that or something on the other side of North Carolina. Okay. The Brooklyn, not the That's entirely possible. Good thinking. So, your park is probably like one of these three. This is most of the options, right? 
fat at the bottom, fat at the top, weird and chunky sort of all throughout. Okay? But every one of our parks is going to be a little bit different for substantial reasons. It's not just a quirk of, oh, my park is very top heavy. That's telling you something as a park ranger. That's a very important set of signals because activities are closely tied to things like age structure. So we're not just doing a whole bunch of boring digging on the NPS website to figure this stuff out for the sake of tickling our brains and so forth. This is telling you the right answer for your park's visitors on hard decisions. Like if we have maybe, let's say, only a million dollars a year to build, maintain, and shut down and renaturalize trails across our 800 miles of hiking, equestrian, maybe a few motor vehicle trails across our national park. A million dollars, not a lot of money anymore, right? So just to provide a sense of scale, Shawnee National Forest, where recreation is a top shelf reason for its entire existence, but is only one of six top shelf reasons as expressed in the National Forest Management Act, whatever it was, the Multiple Use Sustainable Act, uh, that gave the Forest Service its utilitarian conservation-oriented mission, naming recreation as a primary reason and so forth. The United States Forest Service got sued by horseback riders and horsebacks and horse riding outfitter businesses all around Southern Illinois who were unhappy with folks essentially ruining the trails, uh, the riding trails across the Shawnee National Forest for horseback riders, making them less safe. So back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there was a lot of con conflict. Uh, we would call this indirect or social values conflict, more on that later. But the very short version is, at times people were changing themselves to trees in the Shawnee National Forest to stop timber extraction, also one of the top shelf reasons for any national forest to exist. But a lot of folks uh, in and around the Shawnee didn't agree with that part of the mission of the Forest Service, so they buried themselves uh, in logging roads, chained themselves to trees. A modern version of this might be super gluing yourself to the floor of some kind of operation or vehicle that's used to do this kind of thing. Uh, and they also crucially spiked trees. So when you hammer things like nails or railroad spikes into uh, the ligamentous, you know, the hardwood tissue of a tree, and then send that 16 foot section through a sawmill, it's gonna cause that sawmill to explode, right? Metal catches on metal instead of going through relatively very soft wood material. And the, uh, the ensuing disassembly is incompatible with nearby human life. So that would be classed as eco-terrorism or direct action for folks on different ends of the political spectrum. Another uh, sort of eco-terrorist operation or conflict on the Shawnee with respect to horses was spreading four-pointed mines called caltrops. Um, so there's a spike in each of four directions. The geometric figure is a D4, for those of you who play Dungeons and Dragons, a caltrogon. And the nature of a caltrogon, its geometry, is that no matter how you throw it out, there's always one spike pointing up. So imagine a three to four inch tall metal thing with a big three, four inch nail at this 109.107.5 degree angle, whatever it is and spreading a whole bunch of those on horse trails. So the horse comes walking along, and that spike goes through the frog, the very soft part of the nail material, the keratin, that creates the hoof, and that is supporting the animal. Typically, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred, a thousand pounds, plus rider intact, and so forth. So that spike goes right through that hoof. And for those of you who understand we're familiar with equine physiology. Those tendons, those ligaments, those muscles that are attached to that essentially tip of a finger, well, the horse is actually their fingers fused together into a monopod. 
Um, when you injure a horse's foot or break a leg bone on the horse, there are thousands, up to thousands of pounds of tension through those tendons that are capable of handling over a ton of force per leg, right? So um, when you injure the horse, you can't just like throw it in a cast and you know tell it to vape for six weeks while it heals up. You generally have to sacrifice, euthanize, kill the horse. So that is done in a humane way as possible. This is humans causing this attack on other humans and horses. So when the horse steps on that, throws the rider, rider gets hurt or killed, horse has to be killed, even though the horse didn't do anything wrong. Okay? So, some pretty legitimate friction on the Shawnee National Forest in the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, mostly peaking in the 90s and tailing off a little bit since then, but that has never really gone away. Some of those spikes are still on some of those trees and nobody's talking about it. So that's a permanent decision undertaken by a few people that puts a lot of other people's safety at risk or very strongly held political opinions on one side or the other. Unfortunate. So the Forest Service is stuck in the middle here. They're just trying to forest service, as they do. And the horseback riders organize back in the day, like late 90s. They're like, this is totally unacceptable. Our riders and our horses are being hurt and killed for other people's political opinions. And Forest Service, you're not preventing us. You are not providing us safe, effective, and sustainable horseback riding trails. And the Forest Service is like, look, we're doing the best we can. But the judge was like, yeah, I mean, the horseback riders are strictly correct, so the federal court. Forest Service lost that case. I don't think they were too surprised or even upset about it. But the Forest Service's response to losing that case was over in Washington, D.C., unlocking $5 million of trail building money to build a huge set of world class trails, miles and miles and miles of trails, and some of the hardest to sustain soil types. Face of the planet, the Yoria Bus and Alfred Silicone. It's basically just baby powder, which is amazing for growing like corn and soy and stuff like that. Like, there's a reason the Illinois Monster Bucks are Monster Bucks in Southern Illinois. But they're super hard to maintain for uh, horse trails, and the Forest Service built world class trails over the course of the following 10 years, ending in around 2008 to 2010 or so. So, back to our conversation. You have a million dollars at your national park to build trails, maintain trails, to shut down trails for that year. And you'll have another million dollars probably-ish the following year, but this year we gotta figure out what to do and why, because people are going to be impacted by your decisions. So, if your age structure for your park is inverted. It's super top heavy. Like it's all septuagenarians and octogenarians, a whole bunch of retirees. Maybe it's a Sunbelt National Park, Big Bend, Everglades, something like that. Right? That's one kind of needs, demands for trails. And if you have a whole bunch of school age kids coming to your national park every day, during the school year, spring and fall, and a whole bunch over the summer as well, with like homeschooling groups, that sort of thing. You have a very bottom heavy age structure. Well then, that's a very different set of trails. Those school kids don't need, they can't use, if they're going to be wasted on long distance backpacking trails that take you up to the top of the mountain and they're super burly and dangerous, but man, those views are incredible. Wow. We don't want to take school groups like deep into the heart of uh, coastal Alaskan grizzly territory or habitat, right? So something as dorky and as boring as the age structure gives you a very clear sense of 
we can do anything with this million dollars of trail stuff just this year, and we're going to. But this is the one thing out of a million different options that we are actually going to do, and this is why. Make sense? All right, cool. So, all I have to say, don't feel bad if it's a little bit hard to find this info. It gets better. We'll plans and so forth together. All right. So, from there, let's get into our field trip logistics and put a pin in this for just a sec, and then we'll come back to trip and user characteristics for the balance of class. All right, so for our field trip, as John was asking before, is our field trip gonna be like an afternoon thing, one, two, three day thing? Generally speaking, our template for field trips in this class is gonna be leave on Thursday late or Friday morning on who's interested and available. And spend Friday and Saturday all day out on the water. It was actually a riverways in this case. And then come back at some point, like Sunday noon, Sunday early afternoon, something like that, so folks can shower off, study, have some dinner, during the class, and then leave, and so forth. So, how much time would you guys and gals and non-binary pals like to have canoeing? and camping over at Ozark City Riverways for a field trip this semester. The other key piece of information for this decision making is that for anybody who just cannot make this field trip because of you got to have a job this semester to sort of keep the lights on and stuff like that, there are other options, alternatives for the field trip if you can't make that weekend. Okay. It's essentially do something similar to what we're doing but separately from the class with whatever works out with your scheduling needs. Okay. Safely, effectively, and responsibly, and all that. So, with that caveat, would you guys like to go like Friday morning and get back as early as possible on Sunday? Friday afternoon for a super short trip relative to the amount of paddling and stuff like that? Would you like to have a longer runway for the trip? Being as early as Thursday late afternoon to get there, uh, get on site around sunset, camp Thursday night, have all day Friday on site as well as all day Saturday, and then back out on Sunday. Thoughts, questions, comments? Let's brainstorm for a second of class and we'll take a vote and move on with the dates. have a Thursday night thing that should not be missed? Got it. Several people this year. Okay. Good deal. All right. In that case, maybe for inclusion's sake, would everybody be not horribly offended if we started this thing Friday morning? Would that be all right? Do we have water shed until the middle? Okay. That's the only thing class. Probably say something to the professor. Yeah. It hasn't been an issue in the past, but um, yeah. If uh, if we really need to, we can leave like right after that class, right at noon. Whatever. Like if there's a test that day. Yeah, but if everyone wants to go Friday morning, you know, the person will have a lot of things to do. So. Cool. That's true, yeah. Alright. Cool. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? All right, so raise your hand for a miss me with that Friday morning to Sunday noon itinerary park dog. I'll just cut out Thursday night. Say again? I'll just cut out Thursday night. You know, my sister was in the Ozarks. So. 
Okay. Yeah. So, we can say that. So, that's no. Okay. All right. It doesn't look like anybody is really opposed to that. So all hands in favor of a Friday morning to Sunday midday -ish. Okay. It's the majority of the class. Good deal. All right. So pull out your calendars and let's get a sense of when might be okay to do it in terms of which weekend. Registrar.sa.edu. Pull up the calendar, the academic calendar. And I'm going to need your help with figuring out uh, stuff like, I think Conclave, we're hosting that this year or something. So, like, when are student organizations, if homecoming is important to you, help me miss homecoming and so forth uh, with this and so forth. All right, so it is currently the end of August. Labor Day, Monday, September 2nd. No class Monday. All right, cool. Fall break is Friday, October 18th. We have in the past, once or twice, gone during fall break, but I don't want to automatically tie that up uh, for everybody. That's Friday, October 18th. Um, used to be two days of the week, but anyway. And then our next holiday is not till Monday, November 11th. Um, and I believe that I'm going to be out of town for uh, some work stuff right around that day. So, second weekend in November, maybe too late. Maybe. If we want to push it all the way towards Thanksgiving, that's a possibility. All right, everybody got your calendar ready? Cool. Let's pick a time. All right, so um, we we'll probably want to start at least two weeks from now to give everybody a chance to like ask off work and pack and stuff like that. Um, does anybody have any particular suggestions for when nominations for which weekend you would like to go? October's supposed to be beautiful this time of year. It is. Be, um, plus the water will be high enough so we won't have to go trekking turtling across. You know, so, okay. uh, my recommendation is early ish October. That way, we're not freezing balls and we're still got the warm sun on our butts. Okay. Does somebody give me a date? Yeah. I think homecoming is the 11th and 12th of October. Okay. So, maybe, and you said the fall break is the 18th? Fall break is the 18th, that's correct. So, we get, what do we get on Friday and Monday? Say again? Uh, you know, budget cuts. It's just Friday, October 18th off. Yeah. Take fall break weekend? Okay. All right, so we'll tally up yeses and noes for each possible date. But, um, all right, so Friday, October 18th. How about October 25th? Possible. Or we're skipping the 4th, too. We can do October 4th. That's the other one. Good. And October 4th. Okay. Any asks for November? You know, I'm down for it's a much cozier trip on November itineraries. Uh, we won't see anybody else there, which is nice for some, and uh, a little bit weird and liminal and creepy for other folks who are not comfortable going to places without other people. Valid either way. All right, so just for just for grins. Um, Put weekend of November 4th and uh, fall back. Okay. Veterans Day. Say again? No, Veterans Day is the 11th. Yeah. Yeah, next one. And I believe. November 4th is on Monday. 
Yeah. My dates are off, so I'm that. November 4th, 3rd, 2nd, 1st. I can math good sometime. All right. Uh, let's see. Friday, November 22nd would be kind of our last ditch option. That's. I've only done this one other time and it went great, but that is the start of Thanksgiving break. Hell no. All right, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. Cool, so as a class, vote for as many of the following four options as you would like to. So you can vote for yes, all four, uh, for no, you know, four up, four down, any combination of yeses and nos. And then we'll just look for the one with kind of the highest, highest gravity and go from there. Sound good? All right, any other questions, considerations, clarifications before we start pinning this thing down a little bit more precise? Okay, good deal. All right, show of hands for weekend of October 4th, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Go for as many of these as you like. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. October 18th, middle of October, into harvest. One, two, three, six. Okay. October 25th, get towards Halloween. One, two, nine. Okay. And November 1st. Cooler weather. This is usually after the first hard freeze, uh, so bugs less of an issue, but colder at night, which is fine with a little warm sleeping bag. Big one, all right. Yeah, it goes right next to that one. Cool. Looks like we got the day. Okay, so October 4th and October 25th are close enough to each other that we should either do like a vote off or maybe pick the earlier one and keep the second one as a backup in case of like catastrophic rains. Um, this spring we had a problem with some flooding and some facility damage on site, uh, river landings and stuff like that. So with that, is anybody horribly offended if we say October 4th and mean October 4th and then fall back to this if we just can't do it? Okay, got it. Okay, this is pretty good. So, let's start with that. Hopefully, we can, even as we get closer to it, you know, if uh, everybody's cool, then we can just flip back to October 25th. Not a big deal. All right, cool. So, October 4th or October 25th. And we'll march forward in time uncontrollably until we get there. Cool. Good deal. All right, a couple other things about the field trip. Uh, we have plenty of tents, backpacks. Not really going to do backpacking per se, but it'd be nice to, to keep everything together in your, uh, in your canoe. Um, generally speaking, we'll be two people per canoe. We can do up to three, that's totally fine if anybody has a physical limitation or just is not super interested in paddling like all the time. If you are super interested in paddling all the time, we can probably arrange for a kayak for you instead of a canoe, or just do a one person canoe uh, with a kayak paddle. Any of those ways work. If you're not familiar with how to canoe or steer canoe safely, talk with the expert in the room. Uh, I'm just, I'm just flapping my arms here. I'm kidding. All right. So, if anybody has any food allergies, or if you are uh, not comfortable in a moving water environment, let me know. Uh, in confidence, over email, or catch me during office hours, and we can try and work something out. Uh, the goal here is not to put you into a situation which will, you know, induce panic or be dramatically stressful. We're gonna go have a really nice trip. But if 
I need to modify that trip in order to accommodate anything that you feel is important, um, please let me know that so I can do that with you and for you, okay? Cool. Um, so if you want to beg, borrow, or steal equipment from a friend or family member or rent it from base camp or borrow it for free from mine and the backpacking club's equipment cash, any of those options is okay. You definitely want a sleeping bag that can go down to 25 degrees, at least in its survival rate, if not its comfort rate, because we're going to be down in a valley, and at night, in the late autumn, the cold air is dense, and it drops, and it flows above the water downstream. It's called catabatic airflow, and it can drop the temperature locally right there by 10 to 15 degrees in certain more constrained spaces. There are a lot of bluff lines at those are scenic riverways, which will channel air in that way. So the water is about 55, 56 degrees year-round in this latitude. So that will help heat up the water while everything else around it could be um, as cold as freezing if we're there in late October or early November. But we got to prepare like it's going to be raining and storming and lightning and covered in scorpions and those horrible, what are they, archer spiders from the, uh, no, hunting spiders from Australia, and just every possible thing that could go wrong. So if you prepare for all that stuff, it's not going to happen, no big deal. And we can let the water and the current carry all the weight of our stuff, so it's okay. If you have big, heavy, bulky sleeping bags, that can keep you warm at much colder temperatures. Make sense? Cool. Question? We do have some dry bags. Um, what size do you usually have dry bag size? Um, we'll have a box or roll of contractor bags, which we can use as dry bags. Essentially, stuff stuff in there, twist it shut, tie it off with a simple knot, and um, that totally works fine. I also have several like actual rubberized canvas, as it's called, dry bags with sort of the roll top and the clip and stuff like that. Um, the bomber grade stuff that's used for whitewater rafting. And uh, between those two things, we should be absolutely snug as a bug. That's a good question. Cool. All right, so be thinking about how you want to eat on this trip. We can cook on fires, we can cook on stoves, we can cook in Dutch ovens. We're just gonna have this class cooking one way or the other. So think about what kinds of one pot meals are delicious and nutritious. We are not going to eat ramen because I'm tired of dealing with students who have to go to the emergency room because they're constipated. Moving on. Any questions or comments about food for the trip? We can organize that a little bit more tightly as we get closer to it. Are you still gonna bring your bottle warmer thing that you already have this summer? Bottle warmer? Oh, yeah, uh, the canister stoves. Yes, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so we have a supply of MSR Whisperlite 2 international model stoves that can uh, <laughs> they'll run on anything like ethanol, paraffin, white gas, rendered human fat. I'm kidding. Don't do that. And so on and so forth. Uh, we also have some canister style, like isobutane style stoves, the blowtorch stoves, or jet foil type stoves. For those who know that. Jet foil, that was it. And uh, of course, campfires and stuff like that are pretty safe next to a running river. So, lots of different ways to cook and heat and get ourselves out of prehypothermia. Awesome. All right. We got about uh, 10, 15 minutes before we normally break for this class, so let's jump back in. If that's all right with you guys. Back into trip characteristics. Maybe if we have time through the noodling and hogging exercise, or not to get to our user characteristics stuff. All right, so let's get this. Also, 
Before I ramble on too long, what time does that delicious smelling cookout start? Five. We got plenty of time. We're good. All right. Yeah, well, missed opportunity. That's all right. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So, for other aspects of trip characteristics. So we've got user characteristics, trip characteristics in the chapter that we've been uh, starting on, chapter two, in your Studies in Outdoor Recreation, third edition by Robert M. Bennett, a giant in the field, up to and through his retirement several years ago. My old master's degree advisor, and a heck of a nice guy. Um, we've been talking about trip characteristics, and we spent a bunch of time and effort on the activity on site. So you guys have at least a starting list of what are people doing when they show up. Um, we talked briefly about this idea of um, mode of transport. So for example, um, hang on. We want to have a difference between did you catch the front light there so it's not super washed out? All right, cool. This idea between what is the mode of transport and what is the activity. So let's see, with this. A very fancy kind of video called a cinemagraph. There are no expense for you guys. Um, so there's the movement of the activity itself. In this particular uh, graphic, this might be at Banff National Park up in Canada, maybe. Uh, bike packing, cross-country mountain biking is the activity itself. It's what you came to do on site. Motor transport again, just to reiterate the difference between the two, they are adjacent concepts, is how did you get to the trailhead so that you could do the activity? All right, so mode of transport for this, for most of us, is going to be a car. For some people, it's going to be an RV. Now, think about the logistics of some people showing up to your national park and their mode of transport if they're not trailing one of those little, like, come along Jeeps behind it on a hitch. If their way of getting around the park is a 50 or 60 foot long RV, and they're going to leave that RV at a trailhead so they can go biking, we have to factor in what's the activity and what is the mode of transport because we got to have facilities that can handle both. And RVs since the 1940s and 50s when they started becoming a thing have been getting bigger, longer, and heavier. Meaning we have to pave stuff that never had to be paved before. We have to change and jackhammer out old roads and build roads with wider turning curves, turning radii so that they can get that RV to the trailhead parking lot, which used to be just a gravel thing until somebody got bogged down and then we had to get like a heavy wrecker capable of pulling a semi-tractor engine or an RV out of soft gravel parking lots because that person had a need for a facility that just didn't physically exist yet, right? So there's been a couple of generations now of we've got develop campgrounds at your national park. Now we've got bigger, more heavily sort of set up for 60s and 70s era, golden era, forest recreation with the baby boomers and stuff like that. Developed for motorized and closely supported developed camping. And then now we've got folks trailering in those huge $100,000, quarter million dollar luxury horse trailers behind a big dually truck pulling uh, essentially their RV and their horse trailer in one and so forth, right? So activity versus mode of transport as a trip characteristic, okay? So it's pretty obvious what a lot of the activities are for your visitors. The less obvious answer for mode of transport beyond the obvious, okay, we've got a family of four in a sedan or a crossover or a big old SUV like a Yukon or a Kia something like that. 
that's the easy mode of transport answer, and we can handle that just fine, right, with regular sized parking spaces and making sure there are gas stations nearby and so forth. But what about what you are providing as the ranger staff as mode of transport? So, any of you guys, gals, ever been to a national park that has a shuttle bus system? Okay. Shuttle bus systems are expensive. And especially because in the United States National Park Service, you, this semester, are committed to the highest quality environmental preservation. That means we're not running a bunch of dirty, dirty diesel coal rolling buses like the city of Chicago or St. Louis is. We're running much more expensive but clean burning propane buses like at Mammoth Cave National Park. They've been on propane for years over there. They uh, spent a couple of million dollars renovating the visitor center and putting in solar panels um, so that the site is like LEED Platinum certified, like almost completely self-sustained on site in terms of energy and water cycling. Amazing stuff. That makes sense for Mammoth Cave and for a lot of other national parks because Mammoth Cave, if you hurt the water quality of Mammoth Cave by 1%, it's the water that made Mammoth Cave, right? So you are hurting permanently. You cannot clean out a cave system if it gets chemical pollutants in it. Like what drips from a cracked crankcase. Like what is dripping out of a cracked radiator, right? Antifreeze, transmission fluid, all this stuff. Some pretty nasty chemicals. So putting in that shuttle bus system, each of those shuttle buses, at least when we did a study like uh, specifically focused on shuttle bus uh, deployment at Rocky Mountain National Park in the mid aughts, each shuttle bus can pull hundreds of personal vehicles out of your park's trail and road network. Hopefully, mostly the road network. If you have cars driving along your trails, that's a whole other problem. But you don't have to have enormous parking lots at all of your trailheads have a shuttle bus system serving those trailheads. But that means you gotta buy a fleet of buses, train a fleet of drivers, have some expert maintainers and mechanics and logistics support on site to keep that fleet dispatched and running, and so on and so forth. All right? So a lot of us, you know, we're thinking about being a park ranger and being out there hiking trails and saving people and giving people junior ranger badges and like all of the uh, the feel good, the fuzzy, warm fuzzy kind of stuff. But we also need to think about mode of transport. What do people need? If it's a bunch of hiking trails, then a shuttle bus is the right answer. If they are equestrian trails, a shuttle bus is no use at all, right? You're trailering in and around a whole bunch of shuttle buses. That's extra congestion. Okay. So, for your national park, think back through that list of activities in terms of the activity and then what kind of mode of transport do I need? So, mainly when I say mode of transport, I want you to think trailers, horse trailers, jet ski trailers, fast boat trailers, whatever kind of trailers folks need, those folks are maybe going to not need or be able to use or be opposed to a shuttle bus system, which is expensive, but it cleans up your park in terms of noise. It cleans up your park in terms of chemical pollution on the ground and in the air. It cleans up your park in terms of traffic congestion and wait times. If you've ever been in stop and go traffic in a major national park for hours at a time, you understand how important a shuttle bus system Cool. So, that's pretty important stuff. All right. A boat itself might just be mode of transport. It might just be activity. It might be both. So, for example, uh, I think anybody this year picked Cumberland Island National Seashore as your park. Cumberland Island National Seashore is right off the southeastern corner of the state of Georgia. It's like a couple of miles up from the north corner of Florida. 
and it's a barrier island, right? So if any of you guys read The Black Stallion as a kid, or Misty of Chincoteague, or uh, I don't know, any of those like kids books about like wow horses running free um, on the sandy barrier islands, Cumberland Island National Seashore is one of those. And the only way on or off that island and to be allowed to stay on the island overnight, it's mostly all wilderness and uh, slave plantation ruins, is on a National Park Service permitted private concession, so private business operated ferry boat. It goes back and forth, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. And if you miss that boat, sorry, you're not getting on the island and you cancel your trip. Like, that's how it goes. Or you buy a local hotel room for a whole lot of money and wait for the next ferry the next day and forfeit that chunk of your permitted trip onto the island. These days, we call them feral horses because they're problems sometimes, not wild horses. There's an important difference there. So we'll get to that later on in our case study section of the class. So, mode of transport means think about trailers. Do people need to be able to pull trailers for activities at my particular park? All right? So, if your mode of transport is like an RV trailer, and that is the deal, uh, let's see. Another fancy cinema graphic. Then this is a very specific set of, not needs, but desires expressed in your visitors in terms of the equipment they are bringing, right? So there's not a lot of places where you can bring heavy equipment to within dozens of meters of an active shoreline. Do you see how this shoreline is armored with natural riprap or Coarse fragment materials, small boulders basically, cobble size on up. This is hard to manage, hard to manage sustainably. If you just turn a blind eye to it, people are going to use it, so that's a way to manage, but it's not going to last long. Okay? So, this brings into question is this a paved path that the person is on? Is it just on the side of a little road right there? Is it like the highway, the local highway, like the high speed, somewhat limited access traffic area, and people are just pulling off on the side? Any of you guys ever seen people fishing and parking off the side of the highway at Crab Orchard Wildlife Refuge? Yeah, all the time when the weather's nice. There's probably some folks out there today sweating it out, right? So this is something we gotta absolutely kind of harp on a little bit because when you're asking visitors, hey, what are you here to do? They are not thinking necessarily in terms of mode of transport, but you as the ranger, you're connecting the dots and thinking, all right, this person wants to do some boating or have their RV um, up and running and so on and so forth. So we need to accommodate that particular thing. Or we don't. Your no is one of the most powerful things in your toolbox as a park ranger, but understand that denying anybody anything may or may not be popular, right? Okay, so uh, let's get through that and take a quick look at Grand Teton as a case study for this. So, uh, let's see here. I'm gonna run through this one fairly quickly, but it should be hopefully useful for us. deal. All right, so Grand Teton National Park, how many folks have been there? It's a tall and skinny park. It's got the Grand Teton Range on the west side. It's got things like Jenny Lake and so forth, a bunch of essentially glacially fed moraine captured lakes, the Snake River headwaters, and then a highway, and then some pretty flat stuff. We call it prairie or uh, 
out west, they would call it more like rangeland. Um, and then north of that, we've got the John D. Rockefeller Memorial Parkway. North of that, we've got the big square of Yellowstone National Park. Grand Teton has some very specific wildlife issues going on there, and particularly bison. Now, in the late 1800s, we hunted bison down to the last one or 200,000 individuals left of the species total. This was a big deal. This was undertaken for a bunch of reasons to cause problems for Native American First Nations folks. Um, sport hunting was, for the first time in human history, sort of commoditized out to anybody with a firearm. And uh, people like Buffalo Bill Cody, if you're familiar with that name from history, would operate sort of gentleman tours where you sort of sit on the open side of a train car and just, you know, Danny DeVito it. So anyway, I started blasting, right? And just not even slow down to get any of those tasty bison. Just see how many you could shoot because there's no way we could run out of bison, right? Until we did. So Grand Teton has a whole lot of bison migrating back and forth across the highway, which can lead to human bison interactions that involve puncturing the pericardium, the the pleural sac, so the tissue around your lungs or heart, um, when folks get too close to the bison, or mostly just like denting in the side of your car and bending the frame, because hitting a bison at any speed is like driving into a tree stump. All right, park. Basic background info. Established in 29, 310,000 acres. is not very big, is it, right? Shawnee National Forest is not a whole lot smaller than this. Like this is single digits multiples larger than the Shawnee, which is the smallest or one of the smallest national forests in the entire system for context and size. Okay. It's uh, got some fairly large, very high quality and sought after wilderness areas. Okay, so some of our wilderness areas, which are units of your national park, and part of a separate but contained national wilderness preservation system. And that gets complex, more on that later. Okay, and then it's also got ORVs, Outstanding Recreational Values. It is either home to rare or unique natural features. There is no other Teton range. It's one of the youngest mountain ranges on the planet. So it's a very toothy and sharp looking mountain range versus the Appalachians, the oldest mountain ranges on the planet, that is so old, it kind of predates big chunks of the Atlantic Ocean. So the Appalachian range runs all the way up across the eastern chunk of the United States, and then has like the rest of that ridge line in like Europe, right? It's that old. Like there's an ocean over part of it now. Okay. So the Teton Range is the opposite of that. And with eight peaks over 12,000 feet, um, it's a pretty big deal. For those of you who ever lived or traveled to Colorado, 14er peaks are a big deal. People love, 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 love to hike and climb up those. Okay. So Grand Teton is the sort of um, hanging thing dangling off of Yellowstone National Park. It is younger than Yellowstone by, I don't know, 50 years or so, and uh, extremely popular because that highway on the flatland side of the Snake River headwaters is pretty flat, and you can just zoom along as long as there aren't bison crossing. Okay, here's sort of the general map. So our Teton Range on the west-hand side, Jackson Hole down here, where you can get expensive microbrews and charter your private jet. We've got a whole bunch of beautiful, beautiful lakes, like Jenny Lake and so forth. I mean, just really picturesque stuff. So the views along that highway are a lot of those classic views you've seen, like the big black and white posters done by this guy Ansel Adams, who uh, traveled around all these parks and took large format 12 and 24 inch negative or silver emulsion black and white photos uh, monochrome before the invention of things like um, bug spray. The guy was an animal 
a legend, an absolute unit, as they'd say in the UK. All right? This is what it looks like. This view and those mountains in the view are the ORV, the Outstanding Recreational Value, the rare or unique features that people come to see. Lots of them. And people encounter wildlife here. It's a little bit creepy camping there. Ask me how I know. All right. There's plenty of good paved roads and a multi-use pathway that is kind of close to that road. And if you've ever bicycled next to a highway, it's not super pleasant, but at least the view's nice if the air's not very fresh. Um, so we get with that high speed access, right? You and I are conditioned as Americans to A, absolutely love our vehicles, and B, get real zoomy in them. So most of our impacts to resources are gonna be based on people either bringing motor vehicles in or going into exceedingly fragile subalpine habitats and hiking around, camping, starting wildfires, uh, climbing on the big flat faces of the vertical faces of Teton, getting hit by lightning, a couple of million volts, flash melts all of your gear, and you fall a couple thousand feet, but you're already dead by that point, so it doesn't matter. Whatever. It happens. Uh, and because we are all chained to our vehicles in our minds, we get into a lot of conflict and crowding issues. Conflict. Write this down. Conflict, we're going to define the semester as I have a goal. Somebody else is blocking me, connecting via my behaviors to satisfaction of that goal. Let me repeat that. This is important. Conflict, as defined for this class, is I have a goal. You have a goal, your visitor has a goal, and somebody or something, in terms of conflict, it's somebody, blocking access to satisfying that goal. So my goal is to enjoy beautiful views of Teton, get my cell phone photo from the side of the road, and so forth. And somebody else has the same ideas, and they've already pulled off on the spot that I wanted to pull off. And they have every right to do that, right? I mean, it's, it's a free country. There's lots of places along the highway to pull off. Like, binders full of places. But, if I wanted that spot for some reason, and somebody else is already there, all of a sudden I'm like puckered up and tense and a little bit angry, and I'm white knuckling my steering wheel and my partner or spouse is like, no, it's okay, honey, we can just drive on five more minutes. It's like, no, I got this, it's fine. So you pull in behind the other group and you just, the youth these days might say, you know, side eyes. Back in the hip hop era, um, you might say, look diagonally at somebody. Right? Conflict. I wanted to get that photo from that spot and some dumbass is already there. So, now I'm angry. Maybe justified, maybe not. I want to go for a nice horseback ride on the riding trails at Grand Teton, right? Live that Yellowstone show experience. But somebody has put cow traps on the trail, like on the shiny. And that is direct conflict. That's direct on site. I'm here physically, you're here physically, and this is what it's like when worlds collide, as the song goes. Okay? Crowding is a separate but related kind of social impact where it doesn't matter how many people are present. Whatever that number is, the objective number of other warm bodies present is more than my subjective sense or decision about how many people should be there. Okay? So conflict is goal blocking. Crowding is a subjective evaluation of an objective use level number 
use density number per square area. And I make the decision that this is too much, and now I'm having less fun. Okay. Sometimes perceived crowding can lead to conflict. They are separate but adjacent impacts. Okay. So this is what the day-to-day -day work at Grand Teton National Park is. There is the formal staff, hundreds of National Park Service employees, uh, bear biologists, um, you know, cryologists, folks who study cryosphere, the icy snow cap section, um, ecologists, acoustic ecologists, right, the whole raft of experts and ologists. And then we have an army of volunteers. Hundreds and hundreds more people, like probably at your national park, that help to do the day-to-day -day work of stretching out folks. Hey, did you know there's another photo op like a quarter mile through just around the river bend? That you didn't know about. Why don't you pull on up to that one? Uh, I'll radio up to another volunteer and, oh, yeah, they confirm that one's free. Go, it's all yours. Go get it. Okay. It takes an army of volunteers to run national parks on top of the professional staff that hopefully you someday will be. Okay, so how does Grand Teton cope with a lot of people trying to use a parkway like a highway? And they are not the same thing. We're not used to bison crossing and causing bison jams on site on our daily morning commute, most places. At least here in Carbondale, we haven't had too many hit by vehicle bison accidents uh, so far. But you never know. So, Manning in our textbook in chapter 13, which we haven't read yet, talks about four big strategies on how to prepare for this, how to mitigate these problems, how to prevent them. First, increase supply. Let's build more highway if the highway is too crowded. That's going to be real popular. Of those 20 lane highways work in Los Angeles. Okay. Or we can increase in effective supply by maybe spreading out the traffic, having more folks get on that highway earlier in the morning and get on that highway later in the afternoon when there's not other traffic and use it more efficiently. Otherwise, we could reduce the impact of use. <coughs> all those pull offs along the side of the road, we can pave those one by one. And eventually, we've got them all paved and like a super wide shoulder that's basically continuous four miles of the parkway and have the side of the road be a big parking lot and photo opportunity. We could do that. That is an option. That would reduce the impact of people pulling off onto the soil and getting bogged down, causing erosion, uh, chemical damage, stuff like that. Third, we could harden the resource against impacts. So we could somehow make the bison more vigorous or we could strap all of the bison with particulate filter nose masks so they're not breathing your and my road diesel all day long. That could totally work. In fact, that's a great idea. I should sell that to the Park Service. Million dollar idea right there. Okay, we can make the resource more resistant to impact, armor it up somehow to filter out the impact. Or we can make the resource, the bison, the views, the experiential opportunities attached to the Right? whatever the resource is, we can make it more resilient from impacts. So maybe if there was a way to, I don't know, stick a vacuum up the nose of the bison and pull those PM 2.5 or 2.5 micron and smaller diesel particles out of their lungs, that's not actually possible. That would utterly destroy their lungs. But if we could, that would increase the resilience of that particular resource against that particular airborne impact of diesel particles, okay? What they do in terms of actual tactics at the practices, the daily work level is develop facilities, right? So increasing supply, reducing the impact of use. Site design, figuring out where is the right place to put one of those pull-offs for a Vista photo opportunity instead of just paving parking lots all the way up and down and letting people sort it out figuring out what's the right speed limit on that highway. It is a highway, but at the same time, it is a parkway, and it has bison crossing it every single day. So do you have people drive 70 miles at 
20 miles an hour. Most folks aren't expecting that. They have enough gas to do that. That would greatly reduce the number of bison impacts and bison kills. But, man, we get some real type A people who want to lead foot it in that three engine Tesla and do that whole parkway at like 90 or 100 miles an hour. My God, this is what the Germans do over on the Autobahns, and we defeated them in World War II, can't we? Well, maybe we can't, right? So, picking a number for speed limit, it's a pretty big deal. Lots of options in terms of transportation management in your park. And finally, we can just have a conversation with our visitors in the pamphlets, in the looping videos in the visitor center, in the visitor face-to-face -face contacts with rangers, Whatever the medium is, the message can be, hey, you know, we have a lot of ice out there, and we sure hate for your nice, it could be a shame if something happened to your nice car, right? So just, you know, slow down a little bit. Enjoy this drive. You will never be able to drive that parkway for the first time ever again. Let's make your first exposure here amazing. Worth all the effort and planning and cost that you put into getting here, right? And sometimes that three minute conversation can absolutely change the entire trajectory of somebody's visit because now they understand. And yeah, they, they know that they're out of park, but we get, we get blinders, right? We show up according to our motivation and we go hard specifically in that direction, sometimes without all of the information available. So that information education approach, we'll talk a lot more about later this semester. But it's one of the options here, and it's very valid. That can reduce the impact of use by informing that use quite a bit. So it's called indirect information and education. Okay. So almost 20 years ago, the transportation plan, hundreds of pages just for this document, calls for a system of multi-use pathways to increase the supply on the off-road sections of navigation and called for a transit system feasibility study to get a bunch of nerds like me into the room and figure out stuff like, what about a narrow gauge light rail system? Like, Chicago's got a light rail system, why can't Grand Teton have a light rail system? Japan has bullet trains. Why can't we have like a, this is America. Our train should have bullets. Wait, I got that backwards. But anyway, figuring out what questions to ask is kind of the translation of calling for a feasibility study on managing any particular part of your national park, okay? Calls for improved road signs, so information and education. But what should those road signs say? Pretty big deal. Visitor information of traffic conditions. Have you guys ever seen those like over the highway LED boards that, you know, click it or tick it? Or, you know, yeah, don't be a jack wagon, let people merge, whatever the message is. Usually they're halfway funny, four or five words long. And now we're seeing the shadow fourth management strategy, which is limit use, right? So first we had increased supply. We can harden the resource against impacts. We can modify use of those resources. Or fourth and finally, we can limit use temporarily or permanently. Here, or there, or everywhere, and so forth. Right? So this is a temporal limitation of use. Pathways restricted to daylight hours. Has anybody ever been to a visitor center and you see a big poster, like a beautiful nighttime sky, it's like Art Deco style, so like 1920s artwork that says, half the park is after dark. Yeah, that's a super famous campaign that the Park Service undertook, uh, what, starting in the 90s when they started managing night skies and like being able to see the Milky Way and stuff like that as a resource. So cutting off half of the visiting hours on this pathway system that's a severe decision. In effect, or conceptually, that's a lot like saying we have 483 miles, however many miles of trails there are at 
Granty time. We're closing half of them. Make sense? It's a big deal to restrict it to daylight hours. So there must be some good reason why. Why do you think this would be one of the serious options that they undertake? redo the trails here. They already have the trails, and the trails were mostly sustainably uh, oh. routed and so forth by 2007 when this was complete. You're saying, like, why did they restrict? Certain yeah, why would they, because, yeah, why would they use people, a nuclear option? Yeah, because some people want to go at night only, not during the day. Yeah. Anybody right. ever been on a night hike? Some of my favorite hikes ever. At Acadia, at Arches National Park. Night hikes are amazing in the desert southwest. Man, you can see everything. Even with the horrible light pollution of Moab, like right next to Arches National Park to the south, the air is so dry and free of particulates that you can still see just the brilliance of millions of stars. It's amazing. So why would they stop there for a second? Why would they cut off the trails at night, do you think? That's going to concentrate all that use that could exacerbate crowding and conflict on the trail system. Brandon, what do you think? Uh, so nocturnal animals are disturbed. So that nocturnal and crepuscular, active at sunrise and around sunset, they have half the park, which is after dark, to do their thing. And also, The humans are in much higher risk of injury when they're sailing along that highway right after dark. And maybe a, that army of volunteers has gone home for the night. And there's nobody saying, hey, there's like 75 bison just chilling in the middle of the road. And you're about to drive into a brick wall at 50 miles an hour. So this is for the protection of the living resources, and it's for the protection of your hikers. After they've finished their hike, they need to leave enough time to get out of the trail system and then out of the road network before the road network becomes much, much more dangerous for everybody. Okay? Helmet, bright colored clothing, and reflectors are mm, recommended. This is soft, doesn't have any teeth. Most folks are going to be like, oh, yeah, no, yeah, no. That's definitely something I would have been happy to do if I had known about that recommendation like three weeks ago when I could have ordered reflectors off of Amazon. But I'm on site now. What am I going to do? OK. And then information on education is repeated at all different levels and points in the trip planning process, park website, and on the on-site and during activity phases. Okay, in that order. Cool. Whew, man. How about I post this on our course website and we don't necessarily spend a bunch of time watching videos in class. Um, but this is a non-trivial thing, right? So. With thousands of visitors a day and having to introduce thousands of visitors every day, new visitors for that day, the basic dynamics of issues happening at Grand Teton means that we got to come up with a cocktail of solutions to solve the transportation needs and demands at Grand Teton. And it has to be something like 99% plus effective. So we got 10,000 people arriving to Grand Teton National Park new each day during peak season, right? So, middle of summer. 10,000 people stepping onto or driving into Grand Teton National Park uh, and starting their time at Grand Teton that day. We are 99% effective at getting people safe. Let's say we use auto collision bison as our metric. We are 99% effective across 10,000 
people. How many people die in hit by vehicle by sea collisions that day? Assuming everybody who hits one dies. Pull out your phone if you're not familiar with percentile man. 10,000. Zero point nine nine is the number of people that survived that day. So there was a hundred years ago. A hundred people a day? Acceptable loss. No, of course not. Right, we're doing it. Reductio ad absurdium. So reduction to absurdity argument here to illustrate that we gotta be a whole lot higher than ninety-nine percent effective in the strategies and tactics that we use. So we use multiple at the same time to try and modify visitor use, to make the resource more durable, and to increase supply of the safe, healthy, and effective resources and opportunities. Okay? Cool. So, is everybody tracking on this? I know, like, torture program, we all hate math. I get it. But can everybody get to this number? Right? So, another way, if you were taught like the new math, 10,000 is just 100 times 100. So, 1 100th out of 10,000 is going to be 100. Or you can just do 10,000 times 1 minus 0 0.9. All good? Same level class, but sometimes when I roll out the mat, people get like all bug eyed at me. All right, I don't want any unhappy people. Questions, comments, verbal abuse about our Grand Teton thing. Case study. We're going to see a lot of these case studies throughout the semester. So, helpful? Okay. This is just to deal with the highway issue. And part of the answer at Grand Teton so far has not been to put in a shuttle bus system, but at Acadia National Park, at Zion National Park, at Grand Canyon National Park, at uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, at lots of places, shuttle bus is absolutely one of the right answers on this list of things to do and eat the cost of. Because the cost of not doing it is way higher. Sound good? Cool. All right, moving on from Grand Teton. What are these people like? How are they showing up in groups or solo lead? And so forth. Let's pause here for a sec. I know it's warm and humid and sort of amniotically gross in here. Take a quick second, stretch your legs. If you need to cut out because your grandma just died, this is your chance. Uh, we'll come on back in in a couple of minutes and pick it back up with group characteristics.